Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Reardon, president of Monocotoke Audubon Society, and welcome to this evening's program, Dance of Herons, the Birds and Other Wildlife of Freshwater. Monocotoke wishes to honor the indigenous communities native to the chapter area, including the Bogusset, Wepawag, Quinnipiac, Tatakit, Monocotoke, and Hamanasset people. As we advocate for the conservation of the land and its wildlife, we're indebted to the work of Native and Indigenous people who cherished the land for thousands of years before European colonization. So let's get started with tonight's program with Pat Lynch, who you all know is a prolific author of Field Guides, the most recent of which is Field Guide to Connecticut River from New Hampshire to Long Island Sound. Pat, thanks for doing this and welcome. Oh, thank you, Dennis. All set. Okay. So for the last 15 years or so, I've mostly been coastal oriented with saltwater environments. And it was interesting um, in, in preparing and then doing this uh, Connecticut River book to get back to freshwater environments. Uh, a little intimidating at first because I wasn't as familiar with them, um, but uh, uh, also fascinating in a lot of ways. It was it was in many ways, you know, like the old saying, um, seeing the same world with new eyes, coming back to it after 15 years of mostly being coast oriented. And um, and I got fascinated not just with the visible things you can see, but in doing a lot of reading about um, uh, current biology and freshwater systems and whatnot, it, it reminded me a lot of a couple of things. One is um, uh, the sort of um, heron's dance, yes, but like the angels dancing on ahead of the pin. There's a vast world below what we can easily see that's out there and influences what we do see. And the other was, um, to paraphrase E.O. Wilson, uh, probably the most famous biologist of the last century, um, it's the little things that rule the earth. He was talking about his beloved ants and, and research on that, but it's true of um, almost everything out there um, another thing that struck me about um, uh, uh, this whole sort of adventure into fresh water is that how much our tools define what we can appreciate about the world. And one of the things I've I've noticed over the last half century of birding and and uh, uh, being involved in natural history is just how much better the optics are. With the old optics and binoculars, it was hard to appreciate things that were close by and small. But with the new optics, especially these roof prism uh, binoculars, has opened up a whole new world, not just for me um, uh, and people who are always interested in butterflies and dragonflies and, and amphibians and all kinds of other stuff. But now they're just, they're just so much easier to see than they used to be. And I think that's had an influence on how we view our local systems. There's a lot more than just birds out there, uh, if you care to look. Um, so some definitions and, and structure. One of the things that, that puzzled me about getting involved again with freshwater environments is how little I understood, or maybe to, to turn it around, how much I took for granted uh, uh, about the environments, and even as much as the basic definitions of environments, like what exactly is a pond? Is a pond different than a lake? Um, is a stream different from a river? Um, it, it, it um, on the one hand, is kind of um, uh, self-evident. Um, uh, uh, on another hand, uh, we all know that popular language isn't as precise as, say, for example, what scientists and ecologists use. Um, and, and in getting involved in this, um, it, it turns out that there is a difference between a lake and a pond and a marsh. And um, according to ecologists, now, if you look on a map, 
uh, you'll see that on Cape Cod, damn near everything that's still water is called a pond of one sort or another, no matter how big it is. Um, on the other hand, there are places in California which um, seem to label every little standing body of water um, a lake of some sort. Uh, and um, But ecologists do have a definition, and it's pretty straightforward. Lakes are bodies of water that are mostly rimmed by vegetation, but are much too deep to have vegetation in the center, rooted vegetation. They have algae and things, of course, in the water, but rooted vegetation. So on a lake, you're not going to see um, uh, lilies, uh, um, water lilies in the middle of the lake. Uh, water lilies require water that's probably not more than about five or six feet deep at maximum. And rooted plants can't really survive in a lake um, uh, of whatever size uh, if it's more than about 10 feet deep. So lakes are deep um, and they don't have rooted plants in the center. The definition of ponds is exactly the opposite. They do, for the most part, have, they're shallow enough to have rooted plants almost all the way across. So a simple definition of a pond, and if you extend that to other kinds of shallow wetlands, a marsh is mostly dominated by emergent vegetation with small uh, uh, amounts of open water in between. So there are actually definitions um, for lakes, ponds, et cetera, uh, one of the other things that's interesting about freshwater environments is how much they're defined, not so much by the body of water itself, but what, what surrounds them in terms of the vegetation. And in the Northeast, in fact, most of the East Coast, there's a very predictable sequence of things that you see around lakes and ponds, and even some larger streams and rivers, this sequence of uh, upland trees uh, grading into uh trees that are uh, more wetland tolerate like black gum, uh, red maple, uh, highbush blueberry, viburnums, et cetera, down to tussock sedges, cattails, things like wild rice, which um, are, are much more tolerant of saturated ground, and then down into uh, uh, areas that are saturated virtually all the time, you start seeing things like uh, arrow, arum, pickerel, pickerel weed, and these are emergent vegetation, and then down into um, aquatic vegetation itself. So there's a definite sequence of things in the structure. Uh, ponds and lakes, but most especially ponds, because they're smaller, uh, have a definite life cycle and a succession of stages over time. Uh, ponds, especially in the uh, in in the temperate East Coast, tend to eventually fill up. Uh, that's that's basically uh, ponds probably wouldn't exist without some kind of feeder feeder stream. Uh, almost all ponds have a feeder stream of one kind or another, and with the water in the feeder stream comes lots of nutrients and silt and sand, and eventually the depression that holds the pond begins to fill up, not just with all the sediment that gets washed into it, but also with um, uh, plant material. Uh, the plants grow in it um, and, and um, form essentially a layer of you know, complicated muck and peat at the bottom, which eventually fills up. So over many decades, uh, what was a pond becomes a marsh or a shrub swamp, um, then into a true swamp, and and eventually, uh, uh, very often, into a moist forest. So there's a successional stage as well. Streams and rivers are a little bit different in that... Um, well, they're, they're a little bit different in a lot of ways. It's an ecology. Um, and and uh, uh, again, I say that um, even though it seems incredibly self-evident. Well, of course, it's an ecology, a uh, freshwater ecology. But it's an ecology with a difference. And in, in, in the fundamental difference is that large parts of that ecology move all the time. An hour later, that ecology may be a mile away. Uh, downstream. So streams have that interesting dimension of time and distance to them, as well as um, all the complex interactions with the environments around them. Um, and they have structure. 
uh, which um, uh, fishermen know about, certainly fly fishermen, anybody who's, who's obsessed with catching salmon, uh, thinks a lot about the structure because of how influential it is to larger animals like salmon, like bass, like other kinds of things. Rapids um, are, are a key characteristic of most kinds of rivers, and um, they're really important because that's where water mixes with air a lot, and, and they're incredibly important for the amount of saturated oxygen in the water. Uh, uh, riffles are, are um, more gentle sort of disturbances in the general flow of things, but again, have a critical useful effect in, in uh, allowing that air-water interface um, to drive up the amounts of saturated oxygen in the water. And runs are longer sort of flowing stream areas. Um, there are also pools that are critical in streams, critical especially for fish, but for many kinds of wildlife, because they, um, if you think about it, living in a stream is in many ways, especially for a tiny animal, a kind of caustic and hostile environment, because you're constantly, it's, it's as if we lived our lives in a 30, 40 mile an hour wind all the time is it's it's a constant fact of life for them and pools offer some refuge uh, they also offer uh, refuge from high temperatures in the summer pools are deeper and cooler so a critical aspect of stream environments another way of looking at that structure of streams with riffles um, which are critical for oxygenating water, alternating with pools. Now, I've really compressed the horizontal distance here just to be able to, to make the point that streams um, uh, do have a very definite structure, and that structure uh, helps to govern the kinds of things that you can see in streams, and as trout fishermen know, um, very much influential about, about where you find the fish and, and uh, the things that fish eat. Uh, closer view of things in these larger pools as i said they are critical to wildlife uh because it's very difficult to live in a riffle it's turbulent um although there's lots of oxygen in there so the the pools offer um a chance to get out of as i said that that constant um uh, a flowing stream of things so it's puzzling when you look at a stream and try and figure out what its ecology is, because most streams, um, especially in the temperate Northeast, run through forests. They do not get a lot of light. So how does the ecology work? We know from high school biology on that uh, plants are the primary producers. But if you look around in the average stream, you just don't see a lot of plants. Um, their uh, streams tend to be hostile to plants for a number of reasons. Um, the constant flowing water tends to scrub their roots. Uh, uh, very often, especially here in New England, there's um, uh, streams are surrounded um, and bottomed by rocky surfaces that, that aren't friendly to plants. And most of all, there's not enough light for photosynthesis. So how does this all work? And it works critically because of the fall leaf drop. And the contribution of leaves to uh, to form the basis of a stream uh, ecosystem. It's also true of ponds, but ponds have um, many advantages in that their their overall ecology is more static. In a stream, it's absolutely critical because the, of the relative lack of plants at the base of the food chain that um, this contribution from the surrounding forest in the form of leaves is what forms that basic food chain. And this is, um, you know, maybe a fancier version, but it's it's the, the basic layers of the food chain and the food pyramid that we've all seen from, you know, high school biology on. And it's not inaccurate, but in doing a lot of reading about what biologists have been thinking about, uh, particularly in the last couple of decades, I realized that there was a whole new world of things, cer certainly new to me, new to this relatively conventional layered view of the food chains in ecosystems and especially aquatic ecosystems. And it's, you know, pretty straightforward. It has a lot of permutations, but basically 
plants are the fundamental producers, the primary producers. And um, there are layers and layers and layers um, uh, of things that eat plants, eat the small animals that eat plants, um, uh, the larger animals eat the small animals, et cetera. And you go all the way up to things like herons and ospreys. So it's not wrong. Um, and the, that, that cycling happens in all environments, although it's a little more complicated in streams because a big part of that environment is constantly moving. But nevertheless, you have this constant cycling of, of producing biomass in plants and animals and, and decomposing them and recycling into the system. But um, what many people have discovered, many um, ecologists and biologists over the last, as I said, several decades, is that below that level of primary producers, there is um, yet another world even below that, an incredibly important, um, critical to the overall ecology of all aquatic systems. It's it's not unique to freshwater. Um, um, and um, uh, it's generally called the microbial loop. And that came about as a, a recognition. Say, when you uh, go out to the average pond, uh, fill up a little bottle, take it back to your lab, uh, put a few drops of pond water um, on a microscope slide and take a careful high-res look at it, uh, you see pretty much um, in, in many cases what you'd expect to see, live animals, live plants, but you see a lot of other stuff besides live animals and live plants, bits and pieces of things, all the kinds of organic debris which make up uh, a, a healthy ecosystem. This isn't pollution. It's perfectly natural. Uh, but many of the things you see, in fact, most of what you see isn't really uh, um, uh, live plants and animals. It's what you could think of as a as a very rich nutrient soup of bits and pieces of of things that have died, bits of plant matter that have been broken down, fat drops, uh, all kinds of things in the water, which form an incredibly rich nutrient soup that's well below that level of of algae and simple plants in the water. And that's what um, it, it is ultimately based on, on these leaves that enter the ponds and streams constantly, particularly now for the next several months, um, all that, you know, billions of tons of plant matter entering our freshwater systems and then being broken down um, and broken down primarily by um, uh, the term of art is the microbial loop. Uh, so the pond water, uh, full of all kinds of potential nutrients, is broken down by very, very simple and tiny things, bacteria, even viruses and things, begin to break down that organic matter. And as it's broken down, then larger ciliates, protozoans, um, uh, and things uh, feed on that. And then tiny things, you know, that begin to on the very edge of what you could see with your naked eye, like Daphnia and other kinds of things, then feed on that. And um, and and also the, the phytoplankton derive an awful lot of their nutrients, again, from this uh, broken down um, organic matter uh, in the pond water. And as I said, this isn't unique to ponds or streams. It happens in all aquatic systems. And it's called the microbial loop. And as it breaks down that rich, nutritious soup down below the level of algae and the stuff we're used to seeing in the food chain, an awful lot of those nutrients then get cycled upward into the more familiar parts of the food chain. Small fish eat the Daphnia and other things, and larger fish eat the small fish, et cetera. So the microbial loop is the basis of an awful lot of what we see. Um, all that, that fuzzy stuff on the rocks and the leaves and the decomposing leaves that you see in streams in the bottom of ponds, that's the base of the food chain. Um, in uh, warmer weather, uh, a leaf may not last any more than about two months or so be before it's broken down so much that you'd hardly recognize it. Of course, in colder weather, the leaves last a lot longer, but eventually and fairly quickly, most of them break down and, and form the base of that critical food chain. And it's hard to see this stuff, but virtually everyone um, has felt 
uh, the, the thing I'm talking about, biofilms. Uh, if you pick up a stick or a leaf or something that's been in a pond or a stream for more than a couple of days, you feel that, that slickness of the surface, that slick, slimy surface. Um, that's a biofilm. And the biofilms are where all that microbial action is actually happening. Those um, viruses and bacteria and microorganisms form a thick gelatinous layer um, it, within which they live. Um, and uh, that's where all of this magic begins to happen, breaking down the leaves and turning them into things that other things can benefit from. Uh, so uh, the leaves break down and um, into these biofilms. I'll give you a closer look. This is a biofilm. Again, it's that it's that slick, slimy layer that you can feel when you pick up a leaf or uh, from a stream or pond or whatnot. Uh, it may not even be visible. The leaf may look perfectly natural, like it just fell off a tree, but you can feel that slickness and sliminess on it. And that's where um, uh, the fundamental base of the food chain is operating, breaking down the leaf, releasing the nutrients of the leaf and making them available to larger things that we can see. And very quickly, those larger things become uh, um, uh, the things we can see easily, crayfish, small insects, stuff like that. I've shown some of the some of the insects that are um, that are more famous, um, in, particularly in streams, because uh, fly fishermen obsess about them because trout are so fond of of these, particularly spring hatching things. But there are aquatic insects all year round in streams and ponds, and uh, it's the insects that that are feeding on on the next layers of that food chain up from the fall leaves breaking down. First, tiny animals that are, are hard to see um, uh, and very small, and then uh, are, are, um, are fed upon by all kinds of different, particularly insect larvae, aquatic insect larvae, um, uh, up to larger things that you can easily see like crayfish, like freshwater mussels and things. Crayfish and other insects will scrape these biofilms off the rocks. Uh, freshwater mussels will filter the biofilm material out of the water, but they're all benefiting from those biofilms um, in the freshwater environments. And then gradually the animals get larger up to the level of things that we would recognize, dragonfly uh, nymphs, and and the dragonflies themselves eventually. It was interesting to, um, uh, as I was doing the reading about these things, to realize what a brilliant overall strategy metamorphosis is in that it allows animals and not just insects because uh, frogs um, and toads undergoing um, uh, not exactly the same from a biological point of view, but certainly a metamorphosis that allows them uh, as with dragonflies, to take a full advantage of the aquatic environment and then eventually transitioning into um, uh, the ter terrestrial environment, mostly terrestrial in the case of toads, um, through a series of steps in the case of dragonflies. Uh, but again, uh, a brilliant overall strategy on their part to take full advantage of not just the pond itself in the aquatic environment, but the, in the case of dragonflies, the aerial environment um, around the ponds, which is also um, very rich in things. So, so very quickly, you go from biofilms in the microbial loop up to tiny animals, up to animals that you can actually see and interact with. Um, and um, of course, um, I'm not personally a fisherman, I'm very proud of having gotten to age 70 without dropping um, uh, $20,000 um, to Orvis for, uh, and getting obsessed with fly fishing like some of my friends. Um, but I'm fascinated with the environments that they live in and, and appreciative of all the knowledge that um, uh, a really dedicated fly fishermen have about exactly how uh, things like trout and bass and other kinds of things use these ecologies. Uh, and um, necessarily, I've gotten much more interested in freshwater fish because of the the um, uh, the new environment, very different from 
so different from marine environments. And I'd have to say, in many ways, much more accessible than many marine environments are. It's been an interesting experience to, to get reacquainted with fresh water and all of the different things you can see, not just as a photographer, but um, uh, I do, when I go out just with my binoculars, I, I probably spend at least half my time looking at things that aren't birds. Because, I mean, once you realize that there's so much more than birds out there, you uh, uh, um, uh, can look at butterflies, dragonflies, all kinds of other insects and, and small uh, aquatic animals. And with these new roof prism binoculars, even the relatively inexpensive ones are just so much better at giving you access to an environment that was with the old Poro prism binoculars years ago, um, uh, were actually fairly hard to see. I've got a beautiful pair of Nikons that's now almost 50 years old. Um, and, uh, and they're great binoculars for birds, but lousy for everything else because the minimum focusing distance is like 15 feet. So um, I really appreciate the current environment that we have, not just for how much better the optics are in general, but um, uh, how accessible that they've made other kinds of things. So I'm not just obsessed with herons. Um, probably my favorite bird is, I think when Gaia made these things, um, she gave kingfishers three extra helpings of personality they're just amazing not just because they're so loud you can hear them virtually all the time but they just seem to have um so much more personality to them you see them in all environments from from uh long island sound shores all the way into deep forest uh so they're uh, i think of them as their sort of quintessential aquatic bird and um just as an aside i've done hundreds of illustrations of birds, uh, particularly over the last 20 years. And the one that occasionally I make um, uh, prints of them, and the, the print that sells the most is this one. This is a detail of it. But there's something uh, just uniquely appealing about kingfishers that people find fascinating, not just me. Um, another favorite bird is green heron. Um, the, and you, again, you find them all over the place. This was shot down in Florida in Wakota Hatchie wetlands, uh, which is um, in the Boynton Beach area. And it's just, if you're ever down in that area, it's just an absolute paradise for people for watching birds and photographing birds. It's a, it's a relatively small wetland, but it is completely honeycombed with boardwalks. So it's, um, it's just a bird photographer's heaven. And of course, we have the same green herons up here in, in more familiar environments. You see them all over the place. Um, I, I, just as an aside, I took my wife out birding. She's not a birder. And we were in a park and we saw a green heron and we walked up to the heron and we just kept getting closer and closer and closer. Sometimes these guys are just incredibly elusive. And other times they're so tame, you can hardly believe it. We walked up to under 10 feet from this great blue heron. And I had to explain that, honey, this usually doesn't happen. <laughs> um, birders usually aren't this lucky, but um, uh, just uh, a bird with an incredible personality that you you see all over the place. And it was, um, you see them in marine environments too. So I think it really resonated with me to see these familiar birds in, in quite another thing, uh, quite another environment. And I've just, uh, again, without getting mystical about it, but um, especially great blues just strike me as old souls for some reason. Um, uh, uh, maybe it's the eyes. I don't know, but, uh, but, um, you just, you just get that sense from them. I got fascinated with water itself, which is an interesting thing. Of course, in marine environments or, you know, water's all over the place, but I had never really thought so much about water. Um, in its various contexts until, uh, it, I guess the freshwater environment in, in many ways is a more intimate environment that allows you to think about things that are so fundamental that we take for granted, like ponds, water, streams, sure. But water is a very peculiar molecule. It has a lot of properties which um, 
allow life, allow life as we understand it now and are familiar with it. Um, but it's a very peculiar compound. Water is its most dense, well above freezing, nine degrees above freezing. So uh, uh, very cold water sinks down. And ice is less dense than water, and ice floats. And it's a fundamental property of water that allows freshwater environments and even some marine environments to exist as we know them today. The fact that ponds do not freeze from the bottom up, they freeze from the top down. And it's a fundamental peculiar property of water. Not very many molecules have that property, but water does. And it, it it's a fundamental enabler of freshwater environments as we understand them, especially in a temperate environment where things freeze. Uh, um, and that density of water also allows another critical thing in freshwater environments, which may not be visually obvious, but is is absolutely fundamental to the health of a, a of an aquatic system. And that is that that very dense forty one degree water sinking down to the bottom. Uh, tends to drive the top to bottom mixing of freshwater environments. It happens in larger streams and rivers as well, uh, but it's it's particularly easy to understand in in ponds and lakes. Um, a combination of of wind driving over the surface of the water plus this heavy water sinking, um, pushing out the 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 um, uh, cool water, um, uh, which then warms up to the top and forms this continual cycling of water, turns over and keeps those fresh uh, those freshwater environments, particularly ponds and lakes, reasonably fresh. If you look over the course of the year, there's an incredible tight link between water temperature and the amount of dissolved oxygen, and like virtually every other living thing, all those aquatic insects, even the plants, uh, by the way, um, you may not remember that from high school biology, but all living cells respire, that is they use oxygen. And so the, the dissolved oxygen in the water is absolutely critical to the health of all kinds of aquatic um, uh, animals. And there is an inverse relationship to it. The hotter the water gets, the lower its capacity to, to hold dissolved oxygen. So in the summertime, you get uh, uh, high uh, levels of um, uh, temperature, especially in smaller bodies of water like ponds that are relatively shallow, shallow and um, and much lower oxygen levels. It's one of the reasons why um, purely aquatic animals like fish tend to be a bit scarce on summer days. Fishermen know this, of course, uh, because they're all hiding at the bottom of the ponds. They're trying to find the coolest water possible because they're having trouble breathing. Um, uh, because of the lower dissolved oxygen levels. Um, it's, uh, there are many challenges to surviving um, as an aquatic animal in the wintertime, but oxygen isn't one of them. Cold water holds a lot of oxygen. On a daily basis, uh, again, we, um, we all know that um, uh, plants uh, as, as a byproduct of photosynthesis produce oxygen. And that's critical to all kinds of aquatic environments. And, um, uh, uh, but as I said, all living cells respire. They, they also require oxygen. So when the sun goes down, all that algae in the water begins to respire, that is use the dissolved oxygen in the water. And they're not producing oxygen until the sun comes back up and they get sufficient light to do that. And this is this cycling uh, is critical, uh, particularly in environments that, that, that get polluted. And it happens every day um, uh, on a bright sunny day, uh, you get much higher concentrations of oxygen in water than you do um, on a cloudy day or, um, uh, 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 or or certainly at night. And as I said, there's a very tight relationship between uh, cold water and oxygen. It's one of the reasons why fish 
are happiest in what we would consider relatively cold water, certainly not water that's comfortable to swim in. Um, and as the water gets hotter and hotter, the, the amount of dissolved oxygen gets lower and lower and lower. There are only a few kinds of um, uh, fish species that um, are uh, have evolved to tolerate very low concentrations of oxygen uh, in the water. So warm water is not friendly to most fish. Also, when um, our aquatic systems get polluted, usually by excess fertilizer and runoff, you have these explosions of algae. So, you know, high school biology says uh, lots of algae, good, right? Lots of oxygen. Well, um, yes and no. Uh, the overabundance of algae causes all kinds of problems. Yes, on a sunny day, they produce oxygen. But as soon as the sun goes down, they have a tremendous demand for oxygen, and that can pull the levels of dissolved oxygen in, the, in, a, in a polluted uh, pond or lake um, down below the level where fish and, and, and plants can tolerate and things begin to die. And it's a vicious spiral because the dead algae also absorb oxygen um, and and um, and oxidize, so the, the it's it spirals downward. It's one of the reasons why this this um, uh, problem of fertilizer runoff is is so lethal to healthy aquatic systems. What you may not have thought about um, uh, much, um, unless you're a biologist, maybe, is that fresh water itself, pure water. Um, seems like it would be the healthiest environment in the world for a fish, but it's actually a very tough environment to live in. We evolved, um, uh, it's sort of the, the general truism, which is generally true, which is our ancestors evolved mostly in salt water, and we still have that salt water running through our veins. Um, we are walking, talking bags of salt water to, to, to some degree. And um, and that makes us very different. And and by the way, fish are the same way. Um, fish are fellow vertebrates. They have a, 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 a different physiology than we do. But um, when you put a fish in pure water, uh, absent any other mechanisms to deal with that, especially, for example, if it's a saltwater fish, it will balloon up with water and, and very quickly its um, internal cellular structure will begin to break down because there's just too much water. All the salt, the essential salts in the body begin to dissolve and become dilute and, um, and the fish dies without some mechanism to cope with the fact that pure water wants to invade our bodies. And so fish have all kinds of mechanisms to cope with that. Um, they uh, are covered with, um, you know, if you ever picked up a, um, a fish, it's covered with a slime, which is very protective, helps shield it from the um, osmotic demands of the fresh water constantly trying to invade their bodies. Their gills and their kidneys have a very uh, sophisticated mechanism for uh, both absorbing what salts there are in the water and excreting as much water as possible. Again, to prevent their bodies from ballooning up. Uh, so uh, the fish um, stomachs and gills and kidneys are all designed to get rid of as much of that pure water as possible and to retain as much salt as possible. And gravity uh, is another fundamental factor that also operates in water, not just air. So um, absent some some way to neutralize their buoyancies, uh, fish would spend a tremendous amount of time just trying to stay in the water. If you've ever uh, been in a swimming pool and, and um, had to retrieve something from the bottom of the deep end, you realize that most of the energy you expend going down to grab that whatever is in fighting to keep your very buoyant body, especially if you've taken a big big breath before you go down, uh, fighting to keep down below the water. You expend a lot of energy that way. That's why all divers um, uh, wear weight belts to kind of neutralize uh, uh, that natural buoyant density of our bodies and especially our lungs. Well, fish don't have lungs. They do have swim bladders, though, which, is, um, uh, which allows them to 
again, neutralize their buoyancy so that they're spending a minimal amount of energy trying to stay at the level that they want to be. And, and they can expand or contract that bladder uh, up and down depending on how high or low in the water column they want to be. The surface of water it turns out to be a fascinating environment on its own. I hadn't really paid a whole lot of attention to all those things on the surface of ponds, especially ponds, but also in, in slower moving streams. Uh, uh, but it's a whole other environment in itself, not just uh, the, the literal surface of the water itself, but even slightly above the water surface in terms of the number of insects and especially flying insects and things that you find there. And even just below the water, uh, because even below the water, the water is a barrier. And I'll explain that. Um, water molecules, as you see in the diagram here, are like little magnets. Uh, the oxygen, H2O, of course, and the oxygen has a positive charge on it. And the hydrogen atoms have a negative charge. So water tends to stick together. And we all know this intuitively because if you um, drop some water onto a shiny, smooth surface, it beads up. And it beads up because of that magnetic effect of the water, that beading, that surface tension uh, is, is the result of that magnetic property of water. And as I said, each water molecule is like a little magnet. So uh, deep inside the water column, there are so many little magnets floating all around that um, that magnetic tendency tends to be neutralized by the sheer number of atoms. Uh, or, or molecules of, of water around. But at the surface, there are no water molecules above the surface. And that magnetic property of the water molecules really expresses itself. And that's why you get that surface tension that allows tiny animals, especially like water striders and, and whirligig beetles, and even larger animals like aquatic spiders to walk across the surface of the water, exploiting that kind of magnetic skin that water has. Um, again, uh, a unique uh, uh, peculiarity of the water molecule that, that is unusual. And here you can see the water um, surface bending, even, even over the slight weight of a water strider, uh, bending but not breaking uh, because of that magnetic surface tension of water creates a whole environment which is not purely aquatic and not purely aerial. Um, and all kinds of things live at the surface of the water. So um, larger animals, even up to the size of fishing spiders, which can be terrifyingly large sometimes, um, and whirligig beetles and water striders, et cetera, take advantage of the surface above the water. Um, but um, you may not have thought about it, but the undersurface of the water is also a barrier, also has that magnetic effect. And it's very difficult, for example, for small fish and small aquatic animals to break through that barrier. So, um, uh, and uh, aquatic predators know that. So they will um, use water, um, the, the surface of water to drive small animals up to it, effectively trapping them under the surface of the water where they can pick them off. Because if you're the size of a minnow, even though the magnetic surface skin of water isn't that strong, um, it may be stronger than you can manage uh, to jump through to escape a big bass ch chasing you. And there are all kinds of animals, um, giant water bugs, dragonfly larvae, and things that take advantage of that, that surface property of water. Um, another thing that, that fascinated me as I went out and looked at a lot of different kinds of, of freshwater wetlands is how um, engineered they are and engineered in a way that's peculiar and unique and in some ways sort of whimsical given who, given who the engineer is. Um, but if you think about uh, what um, uh, our, say, northeastern, eastern temperate environment must have looked like proper, uh, prior to the European invasion of the North America, say, 1620, whatever date you want to choose, um, most streams... Um, and most small rivers were really chains of ponds and wetlands more than they were free-flowing streams. And that's because of the engineers at work on these things. And, um, and the engineers 
uh, created all kinds of wetland environments and became what biologists call a keystone species. This is the engineer, um, the American beaver. Uh, and because of their dam building, they are a keystone species that engineers the environment around them to the extent that they create freshwater environments for all kinds of other things. Uh, um, even, you know, one of the signatures when you look around um, the environments um, for beaver activity is stands of dead trees like this. And you could say, oh, gee, it's too bad it used to be a forest. But these dead trees are incredibly valuable to all kinds of wildlife, whole nesting wildlife. Uh, in particular, things like wood ducks, screech owls, um, even down to the size of chickadees. But also, because they're very rich in insect life, they're um, extremely useful to things like woodpeckers as well, not just for living space in making holes in dead trees, but also in feeding on the insects that are that are on and under the bark of dead trees. And it's the beavers who create those environments. If you think about it, um, there are many, many interesting kinds of the uh, of wildlife and freshwater environments but only one of them is making freshwater environments and that's what makes the beaver so unique and it's wonderful that they're much more protected now and and that we don't wear beaver fur hats anymore thank god and stuff like that so so they're coming back you see their activity all over the place in in especially in northern connecticut where there's more, more open space uh, and beavers aren't the only thing out there, but if you look at the contrast, say, between beavers and muskrats, they live in pretty much the same place, but muskrat is not a keystone species because it very happily lives in freshwater environments, but it doesn't make freshwater environments. And you can easily tell at a glance um, the presence of the two. Uh, muskrats have lodges very similar to beavers, um, except that they're almost entirely usually made of grasses and just have small sticks and twigs in them, whereas beaver lodges tend to be larger and are composed of much more robust branches. So you can tell at a glance who's who, but muskrats, cute as they are, are not creating environments um, the way the beaver is. And so as, as gorgeous as great blue herons are, they've never created an environment. They just live in them. And thank God for that. But, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a property that, that makes you look at certain kinds of species in a different way when you realize how important they are to the overall ecology. And I wish I had, especially lately, going to a lot of freshwater environments, a buck for every time somebody said, there's giant swimming rats in East Rock Park um, and or wherever, name your park. And um, there are many swimming mammals and there are tremendous size differences in mammals. A, a full grown brown rat uh, um, weighs under a pound and is relatively small. And you gotta be looking pretty closely to even notice them. Uh, muskrats are very much larger, three, four, five times um, uh, the size and weight of rats. Raccoons also swim, although not as commonly. And all the way up to beavers, a full grown adult beaver can easily weigh 60 or 70 pounds. So it's a substantial animal. And river otters are also out there as well. They're very secretive. They don't like people, but they are um, surprisingly much more common than you might realize, even in relatively urban places. I've seen river otters um, a number of times in East Rock Park and beavers. They're not common there. Uh, I don't know um, how often they stay there or whether they're um, beavers certainly aren't resident, um, regularly resident, but you see them all the time. So um, be skeptical when you hear about the giant swimming rats. So it's been a fascinating experience to get more involved in freshwater environments. Um, back with my pals, the great blue herons. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 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 happy to um, take questions or uh, observations, whatever you prefer. Over Thanks. to you, Jess. Thanks, Pat. Uh, if you have a question, uh, Use the uh, raise your hand, come off mute. Let's see so, if I can 
find the chat here. Oh, there's lots of chats. Um, questions, anyone? Sue, you had your hand up? No. Sue Stark? Um, anyway, yeah, yeah, turn your audio back on if you have it off or we won't hear you. Sorry, I was just saying thank you very much. I did not have my hand up. That was a lot to take in. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I was trying to clap, not... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Two hands, not one. <laughs> Anybody okay. else? Well, I don't want to. That was a lot to you. take in, Pat. Thank you spot. very much. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I've tried to cram in a lot of interesting things. Um, and um, there's usually a recording of the talk. So if if you can go back through it, if you care to. Yeah, the, uh, re the uh, link to the recording will go out tomorrow. Oh, good. Good. Okay. Well, thank well, you very much. Very interesting. Oh, thanks very much for your attention. And uh, here's the great blue herons. Okay. <laughs> uh, remember, October 12th, uh, burning uh, Ukraine in wartime. Uh, sign up on the website. Thanks, Pat. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you very much. Good evening.